Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. In today's community conversation, we welcome El Paso Independent School Superintendent Diana Saavedra, along with Simon Chandler, who is the Assistant Director of Equity and Community Engagement. We want to thank you both so much for being here thank with you. us this morning. Well, good so morning. We'll get, we'll get right mm -hmm. to it. Let's talk about what's happening in the district when it comes to community schools. Explain um, what these campuses specialize in. Well, um, when we think about community schools, um, if we think back to our mission as a school district and why we exist, um, one of our primary missions is to uh, connect with our community to elevate the learning experiences that we offer in El Paso ISD. Uh, so community schools is a critical factor in helping us, um, you know, really accomplish that mission. And uh, particularly, uh, we provide wraparound services in some of our neediest feeder patterns and um, we're really proud of a new uh, program that we've just launched associated with community schools that really addresses food insecurity and really allows us to address whole child development, remove barriers of equity, and uh, really um, succeed with academic excellence. Um, Simon, you wanna share a little yeah. bit of information about that? And right, so um, currently the community schools program is at the Bowie, the Jefferson, and the El Paso feeder patterns, plus um, Canyon Hills. And so each of those feeder patterns, we've been able to establish family resource centers, which are centers that kind of um, provide needed resources for the families, uh, adult education, um, could be parenting classes. And one of the things that we're very proud of is our food security initiative. So at both Bowie and um, the Jefferson area, this year we've been able to establish client choice food pantries, which is a once a month um, food distribution um, for a needy families up to 100 needy families oh, wow. and um, this particular project we did in partnership with El Pasoans Fighting Hunger um, who provide the food and then also um, through grants with the American Heart Association that provided uh, funds for the refrigerator and freezer and also the Junior League of El Paso. Wow. So it kind of responds to a, a, a need in the community to support our families and our students. Definitely a need. That sounds like something really incredible that right. you guys are putting put putting put forth. I did want to move on about the Montessori program. That is something mm -hmm. that you guys have been working to <clears throat> expand, but obviously you guys, we have seen some pushback from parents on mm -hmm. that. Can you talk a little bit about what makes a Montessori program unique and how you're hoping to continue to move that forward? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that it's uh, been very well received. Um, we just announced our West Side expansion um, and we um, held an open house at uh, Green Elementary where we will be opening our new uh, Montessori uh, program. Uh, we had uh, a number of parents come uh, to explore and really it provides an opportunity and another choice for parents in terms of their education. As we think about public school and the future of public school education, um, for us to be innovative, we're, innovative, we're going to have to continue to be progressive with the choices that we provide parents. And while we have very strong um, K through five traditional elementary choices for parents, uh, we want to expand those choices to Montessori um, so that parents can uh, determine whether that um, you know, delivery approach better suits their children. Mm -hmm. Because it is a different learning approach than the traditional method, right? Something that a lot of parents are looking forward to. Mm -hmm. um, something else that we want to talk about, too, is the dual language program. So we know that there's some changes coming to that as well from that 90-10 model. Um, explain to us why that decision was made and how this is going to benefit students in our region. Mm -hmm. Well, um, if we think back to um, the federal law and uh, to the laws in the state of Texas, um, as school districts, we're bound to provide bilingual education to students who um, are identified as emergent bilingual children. So that is what we're required to do by law. Um, and so when we think about our uh, dual language program, although we were servicing our emergent bilingual children, the data was showing that the model that we were using was not um, adequately addressing all of their needs. Um, and so we, um, we did uh, an internal audit of the program. Uh, we found that there was some implementation deficits that we were experiencing. And so we took a step back and we made a determination about what uh, approach we might use with new incoming cohorts so that we could um, you know, reset our program and move forward so that our program is designed to primarily address um, the children that it was intended for, which is our, our emergent bilingual children. 
And with this school year about to come to an end, you and I were able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation last school year, and we talked about some of the buildings and the enhancements that you guys were looking to put forth for some of the older buildings especially. And obviously that conversation between you and I, it came as the parents were frustrated and students were complaining that some of the conditions they were having to work inside of the school were unbearable. They were complaining about the heat, and you mentioned that a lot of these schools, they do have swamp coolers. Can you talk a little bit about the enhancements with that. Has anything been done to mitigate that situation? Maybe adding refrigerated air going into next school year where the months are supposed to be hotter? Mm -hmm. Well, what we've done is we've used our ESSER money in a number of campuses across the school district. Um, over the course of the spring semester, uh, there's been um, 20 plus campuses where we've um, invested over $30 million of our ESSER funding um, to improve. Um, the air conditioning in our buildings in common areas, um, the cafeteria, the gyms, and, and, and just common areas where there's large groups of students who, who congregate you know, during the school day. Unfortunately, uh, in El Paso ISD, um, as I've stated on a number of occasions, the average age of our facilities is 50 years old. Um, and the district, although we passed a bond in 2016, that bond was not enough to really address uh, the needs of our buildings across the, the organization. And so we still struggle with um, you know, swamp, cooling, swamp coolers. Um, and so that is something that we're gonna struggle with until we're able to pass you know, a bond uh, in the future. Uh, the earliest that we could consider even bringing a bond to the voters would be in November of 2025. Um, so that remains a challenge that we have to continue to be strategic and uh, creative about to address the need. Mm -hmm. And I guess really quick elaborating off of that, so are you saying that parents should expect their kids to be able to have to work in those environments um, going into next school year? And then what are some things that you guys are looking to put forth? Are fans gonna be allowed inside of the classrooms? Are students gonna be allowed to get breaks to step outside if they need a breath, a breath of fresh air? Just because people were saying that, you know, it was hard for them to focus because of the heat. Right, well, what I would share is that we never wanna put our employees and our children in uh, poor learning conditions. Again, I'm gonna emphasize that the age of our facilities is significant and the upkeep of the facilities has not necessarily been consistent in our school district. Um, so as we look ahead, um, we will have to be strategic. Uh, in some cases, you know, fans may be permissible. Um, obviously, we're gonna make sure that students are properly hydrated. We're gonna find areas of the building that may be more comfortable and be strategic with where we house students. Um, in some cases, we've got um, temporary buildings on some of our school sites where we might, during the hottest time of the day, be able to transition students so that they're more comfortable and their teachers are more com comfortable. So we recognize that that's a challenge and we're always in a position to deliver the high quality, quality, highest quality learning experiences. So um, we'll work with our campus administrators and with our communities to make sure that we can provide as much comfort as possible given the challenge that we're faced. And that all ties in with obviously budget for the district in the recent board meeting there was a discussion about truancy and the efforts that the district has made to bring those numbers um, up right you're getting more students in the classroom and that's tied to funding how has the lack of state funding particularly hurt the el paso independent school mm -hmm. district well what i would share is that the el paso independent school district is in a good position um, when we think about our budget um, we passed, we were one of the only school districts in the state that passed a balanced budget uh, for the 23-24 school year. Um, we were only able to give teachers a 2% raise, but we uh, passed a budget that was balanced. Uh, we also have over 89 days in our fund balance, which means that uh, if there were to be a significant emergency, we could operate as a school district for a full 89 days with any, no additional funding coming from the state. Um, as we're starting budget planning for the current school year, um, we, we aren't getting as much funding from the state uh, based on some of the new legislation that was passed uh, that provides uh, taxpayers a $100,000 um, property tax exemption, a homestead exemption. Um, and so be, we will be 
um, receiving significantly less funding. However, we're working to build our budget just as we do every year and we'll be strategic and conservative in some areas, but we're certain that we can continue to um, you know, not increase our insurance premiums for our employees, which is critical and important. We've been able to keep those at the same rate for the last three years and our goal is to continue to move forward with that uh, to honor our employees. Uh, if we're able to consider any um, you know, in increase in their salary, then we certainly want to be in a position to do that. Um, our primary responsibility is to invest our budget money uh, to support our strategic priorities. That's Thank all. you so much for mm -hmm. providing insight on that. Thank you to the both of you for taking you. the time to be here with us this morning. Mm -hmm. Also, registration is underway for the El Paso District. We do want to point that out, and it is an open enrollment district. So uh, parents, again, a reminder, right, that Absolutely. Is underway. Go to our website. We've got a school finder where we, you can do research on any one of our schools uh, and make the choice that's best for your child. All right. We'll have this entire conversation online if you missed it in a replay of previous community conversations. We'll be right back after this short break.